Thank you very much. It's such an honor to speak to high school kids about bravery. Because I don't think there's any other time in our lives that we're needing to be more brave than in high school. And we're also about ready to go through a huge transition where we're gonna, our lives are going to change a lot, we're going to change a lot, and it's going to require a lot of bravery. But before I get into that, I just want to thank Jen for that very sweet introduction. I'm a huge fan of hers and a huge fan of her husband, Ian Prince, who is a, one of the most remarkable drummers out there, and that's not an exaggeration. And again, super honored to be here. So let's look at the title of my bravery talk today. I've never given an hour-long talk on bravery. I've never had to think about bravery so much. I have thought about it in my own life, but communicating it is a whole other thing. The exceptionally brave act of following our childlike dreams. We're going to get into all of that. I'm not going to explain it now. But it is about, as you now contemplate the next few years, people are asking, where are you going to college? And you're like, I don't even know if I'm going to go to college. What are you going to do? Who are you going to be? And you're asking yourself those same questions. So this is about reaching back into your childlike dreams and ambitions and passions to kind of try to mine what you are, who you are, and what you want to be. So let's get started. Spy Mob was one of the manifestations of my childhood, childlike dream. Jen made reference to it, but this was a band that I was in from 1992 to 1993 to 2005. It was a big deal in my life, and along the way we got to work with some pretty cool people. And you probably know that guy, Pharrell Williams. Who knows Pharrell? And are you happy? And are you happy you know Pharrell? Uh, he's a rem that's me on the drums. That's my buddy Twig. And there's Chad. And there's Brent Paschke, who's still playing guitar with Pharrell. It was an incredibly exciting time in my life. It was a number of years between like 2001, 2005, touring. I'll get into that. And then, as I'll explain later, life changed. My dreams changed. And I started a music company with a buddy. And we create music for film, TV, and advertising. And it's a dream job that I didn't even know was a dream until it, until it happened. And now I also have a blog called Dumb Drummer, because that's our reputation. We're dumb. And I talk about creativity, and I talk about things like bravery, and um, kind of get into the workings, the inner workings of creativity and collaboration. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. So a few things before we dive in. One, I bravely confess that this is my cheat sheet right up here. So I'm going to be looking at that because I have a lot to say and I didn't want to take a tangent because I, I'm good at tangents and then never coming back. Secondly, I'm going to talk and then we're going to talk. So I want to say a bunch of stuff, I'm going to talk about my journey, and then I want to talk about break down bravery a bit talk about that, and then I'd love to have some like, question and answer or discussion. i got to be fast. Who am I to talk about bravery? Right? Because I'm the first one to tell you that there are many times in my life when I haven't been brave. There have been many times when I've been the opposite of brave, and I've been scared, and I've been afraid, and felt fear, and been a coward. But that also means that I've thought a lot about bravery because I've had to kind of had a, my own relationship with it. So I'm not coming as an expert on being brave. I'm coming as an expert on a relationship with bravery that we so, sort of grow up with over time because we're constantly coming back to ourselves and being brave. Basic question, just one or two people, if, if you're brave enough, what does it mean to be brave? Like what, what's a definition that you think, it can be your own definition or, or a definition that we generally accept? Yes? Stepping out of your comfort zone. Ooh, stepping out of your comfort zone. That's a good one. One more. Someone who's just about to raise their hand. Yes? Doing something you're afraid to do. 
Absolutely. Those things are very... That, that Going outside of your comfort zone or being afraid and then doing something anyway because you know it's good for you, that's brave. Childlike is a word that I'm going to talk about today and sort of reclaim as a positive thing. But what does childlike mean? Yes? I mean, it's something in a way we all lose when we grow up. Ooh, that's a key. That's a key uh, insight. Something we all lose when we grow up. That is, that, we'll talk about that too. Yeah? Well, oh, that's a good, I, li I literally got shivers when you said that. Uh, but to be carefree and to do, to do whatever. I don't always get shivers. Yeah. Fun loving. Yeah. Carefree, fun loving. One more childlike. Yeah. Say that again. Ah, things that aren't completely reasonable. I like that. Reasonable, there's, that's a loaded term. It's like, it's not being an adult. It's being childlike. But sometimes being unreasonable is being awesome. So last night I figured um, I'd ask my daughter, because I wondered how to get started here with, with defining bravery. I said, Cecilia, well, let's let her, her tell us what she said. So, Cecilia... What is bravery? Um, bravery is like when like someone like takes you down and like punches you and like bad stuff to you. You you like stand up and then and then you like you fight back and then you're really brave. Like if it was a monster and then you. And then you fight back and you be brave. And when have you been brave? What's a what's the time that you've been brave? One time I was a long time ago, I think it was when I was five. I'm six. And a long time ago, uh, I wanted a hat at a garage sale and I couldn't say please for the hat. And then I did it, and I was brave. Let's hear it for Cecilia. She's, she's good like that. Like, she'll go out and kick monster butt all day. She won't say please, though. But then when she does say please, she's like, I'm really brave. But she is one of my heroes when it comes to bravery. It's so cool being a dad. I've got three kids. I've got two boys but they're kind of old enough now, they won't play my games, they won't answer my silly questions. Cecilia's so good for it. And so when I ask her about bravery, she's like, I'll give you a great answer. But it's so cool to see, I call her a new person. Like, young is so loaded, it's just like young people, kids, blah. But when you think of them just like as new people, like seeing stuff for the first time, like we can take all kinds of lessons from that. And I'm learning from this girl who's six, not a long time ago when she was five. But I'm learning from her all the time. So I'm at part of, a lot of this speech is coming from my relationship with my kids. So I'm going to go and tell you as fast as I can a story about my journey with my childhood dream of being a drummer or my on-again, off-again relationships with fear and bravery. Bravery and fear. So that's me digging on my brave paramedics. Uh, I was a normal kid, but around the corner in my mom's kitchen, probably at this moment, were pots and pans all over the place. And I didn't know it then, but that was the start of my fascination and obsession with drumming. I would go in there with my mom's wooden spoons and bang on those pop pots and pans all day, but I had no idea that it would lead to anything else. And then I discovered Kiss. <laughs> Kiss Destroyer was my first album, and I heard Peter Chris on another album, the drummer for Kiss, play a song called 100,000 Years, and there's a drum solo in there, and my mind was blown. I formed a band, and we played air drums and air guitar to Kiss Live 2 for our parents. I was age eight. 
One year later, age nine, I got my first real drum set in that catalog, JC Penney, 1978. I was obsessed. I would look at that page and look at that page and look at that page, and my dad got me the drum set. But what was I going to do with it? I don't know. I played along with Kiss Records and Pablo Cruz and whatever else my sisters had, which was like Joni Mitchell and Carly Simon, people you've never heard of. <laughs> Age 12, I started my own band with two brothers. We were a power trio called Outrage, and we like to think that that graffiti in Ames, Iowa was because of us. <laughs> Truth is, I don't know, but we kept that picture anyway. <laughs> we were serious. We had a business card. We played proms and formals and dances and bar mitzvahs and benefits all over Iowa, and we did it for six years, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. We were going to be famous. We made demo tapes. We wrote original songs in addition to playing most of Rush and the Police's catalogs. That was my first gig when I was 13. Hundreds of bicyclers touring across Iowa stopped to listen to us play. I was scared to death, but I was brave because I was on a mission. My childhood dream was raging, and I was confident. It's age 17, I'm still at it. And then, some message came to me. I honestly don't know if a parent said it to me or if a friend said it to me. My parents are very loving, but kind of traditional. But somehow I got the message in my head, and I still remember it verbatim. So either I created it myself, I got it from culture, or I got it from a, an authority figure. Eric, the great thing about music is that it can always be a hobby, right? This thing that I love since I was a kid, it, like, I would go crazy without my drums, and then suddenly I'm 17. I'm on my way to possibly college, and I think, you know what? Music's meant to be a hobby. It's not practical. You know, you're not responsible if you're a drummer. How could that be? How do you be a dad and be a drummer? That's crazy. So, I grew my hair out. I became a hippie. I sold my drums. I bought books. Academia seemed like a grown-up direction. And I truly did love school. And I would never say that I didn't. I, I dove into my studies. I loved it. I didn't have much of a social life. I was really studious, not very social. And I fell in love with the story of how, follow me on this, I'm going to go, go deep in history right now, of how it came to be that the Earth was no longer seen as the center of the universe, and that it was recognized that the Earth is just a planet, and that the sun is the center of the universe. I loved this story because it seemed so rebellious. It's, and when it happened in the 16th and 17th centuries, it was a crazy idea. And I fell in love with the story of the guy who said, no, we need to put the sun in the center of our solar system, not the Earth. Which is so interesting because I became obsessed with a guy who was following his crazy dream, but I wasn't following mine. And I've always thought that was interesting because I was on my way to grad school. That, by the way, is the, the map of the universe after Copernicus with the sun in the center. But I was on my way to grad school to get my PhD. I'd been accepted at the University of Madison for studying this guy. And what was really happening is that I wasn't putting my own sun in the center of my universe. And then I got a call. I was literally. Stopping over in Chicago, before I went to Madison, I got a call from a guy I played in a band with in, in college. It was just like a hobby band, right? We weren't serious, because that wasn't the practical thing to do. John was his name, John Osby, lead singer of Spy Mob. And John said, you know, this is crazy, but I'm out here in California. Do you want to form a band? I was like, that sounds exciting, but impractical. Uh, why? He said, well, I'm writing these great songs. And he played the songs for me over the phone. And they were great. So we talked two or three times. And at the end of that sort of half week of talking, I had turned my car around. 
and made plans to meet two months later in Minneapolis, and we formed a band called Spy Mob. So after four years of kind of taking a detour, doing something really fascinating, and I'm really glad I did it. I learned some great school, skills in school. But my childhood dream, my childlike dream of being a drummer returned with a vengeance. And we were going to dominate, take over the world. We had big dreams, and we were super hard workers. And four years later, after practicing most days, and me practicing the, on the drums like six, eight hours a day. We were perfectionists, and we released this record called Townhouse Stereo, and it didn't do so hot. And what happens when bands release records that don't do well, often, is that there's stress and there's strife, and people are afraid that they're wasting their time, and band members tend to get into it with each other, and we weren't getting along, and so I took off. I went to Rio, I got a travel study grant, I was like, screw that band, we're fighting, we're gonna fail, we're horrible, our record only sold a few copies. And I took that to mean that I was on the wrong path, and so I went and I studied drumming in Rio for two months. Thinking when I got back, the band was probably over. But it turned out that that was not the case, that I came back, Something about me being gone made everyone get along. That was interesting. <laughs> and John was writing incredible pop tunes. Townhouse Stereo had long, our first record had long songs that were hard to understand. These songs were tight, and they sounded like songs that were going to be on the radio. And we loved this little record that we made. And it was the record that changed everything. We sent it out to lawyers. We sent it out to managers. By this time, we were like 28, 29. That's old in rock years. And I literally had lawyers saying to me, you're too old. You're too old. I don't care how your music sounds. Don't, these are entertainment attorneys I'm talking about. Don't, don't waste my time. They literally said that to me. But we were in our brave stage. Our childlike dreams were raging, and we were plowing through. And I was like, screw that. So we found a lawyer who was awesome. And this record got in the hands of record executives, and Epic Records and RCA Records fought over us. It's what's called a bidding war. And we were feeling strong, and we were strong. The band was sounding great live. And we finally signed with Epic. Huge deal. We got a publishing deal. Huge deal. They sank hundreds of thousands of dollars into this band. And we made a great record with a great producer. And we waited. And we waited for the release. And they wait, we waited for them to tell us when they were going to send us out on the road for our huge tour. And it was silent. And then we were dropped. They didn't even release the record. And we were dropped. We thought, the ultimate betrayal. They set us up. And we were able to buy houses with our advance. We thought, this must mean we're going to be stars. This is going to be amazing. And they dropped us. We were called damaged goods after that. When a big record label drops you, other record labels who might then sign you think, hmm, there's probably something I should know about that band. So we were called damaged goods. We couldn't get anyone's attention. And we let it get to us. And we got down. Yeah, it's understandable. But our bravery was not at its peak. We weren't feeling totally brave. Who could possibly get behind us? We were thinking that maybe this was it. And I think we were comfortable with that. And then Pharrell, out of nowhere, that's another story for another time, but super coincidence, he had been given a copy of that record. And it was his favorite record in the summer of 2000. And when he realized that we were no longer on Epic, he connected with us and he said, I'm going to get you signed. And I want to work with you guys, and you guys are my favorite band. I love your chords. I love your jazz chords, your seventh chords. And he became a huge fan, and I flew out to New York, and I met him, and suddenly there was P. Diddy, or whatever he was called at the moment. And we were in the world of hip-hop. 
and our, the whole complexion of our career was different. We had no idea, and that's a huge point. You have no idea what happens if you stick with it, if you stick through it. And I'm not saying that we knew we were going to, because we didn't. But you never know. But if your dreams are pure and you're hitting on something real, suddenly you get a Pharrell Williams behind you, and everything changes, at least for a while. We worked on them, with them through two album cycles for about four or five years, touring the world. Pharrell was good for his word, and he got that record signed to a new label, Arista. Traveling the world on airplanes, having a fantastic time. That's in Jamaica with a cool young fan who looks happy. I got to be a rock star and, be, and to be pretentious. That was to my drum tech. I got articles written about me. That was pretty fantastic. Got to be, look, got to be in a magazine looking all cool. And then we got to play all over the world for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And NERD was a very experimental band. It was an incredibly musically rich band. And it was one of the great, oh, there's Fergie. We got to be friends with Fergie and the Black Eyed Peas. They were actually opening for us for a good chunk of the time. And then it was over. Arista dropped Spy Mob. Arista didn't release the record either. NERD ceases all activity and Spy Mob has babies and we call it quits. It was done. And this time it was really done. We ultimately did get that record out on another label that was a kind of a sister label to Epic, ironically. Uh, but we were done. And I had two sons at this time. And I was like, what now? I mean, talk about a moment where I had to be brave, and I wasn't. It was scary. But I kept on being hired as a drummer. And so my childhood dream of being a drummer was carried forth. And one amazing artist I worked with is Wang Li Hong, and he's sort of the Justin Timberlake of China. He's bigger than Justin, though. And we, when we would play, we would, we would play stadiums. I took 15 trips to China and had an amazing time. And the fans there are great. And I was a total freak in that environment with my surfer hair and my six foot one. And just, I got to be a freak and I got to be an alien in, an, in another land. And that was great. But there was something else going on. And that's that I, I realized I didn't want to be a drummer. And this is what's weird. And this is something that's a really important point here as you think about bravely moving through and into what you want to do and who you are. Drumming was no longer my biggest passion, my childlike dream, and maybe it never was. Because I realized that if I hadn't formed outrage with my two friends and spy mob with John Osby and Brent Paschke and Brian Ressler and Christian Twig, I probably wouldn't have been a drummer. Because what I realized at that moment when I was tour traveling the world and playing with cool artists, it wasn't my art, it wasn't my project, it was theirs. And so what I realized my dream was, was to collaborate with others. Not necessarily to drum, it could be anything. We could be like building super high-end toilets made of gold. As long as we thought that that was a really important pursuit, that's what I loved. I love collaborating and I love being an entrepreneur. I got to do both those things in my bands. And all the, all the time I thought, I must love drumming. And I like drumming, but it's really collaborating that I love. So that's where Egg came from, my company where we make music for film and advertising and TV. We also have artists on a roster and we release records by those artists. And we are engaged in lots of other collaborative creative projects. And so I was in my late 30s before I realized it's not drumming that I love, it's collaborating. OK, that's my story. But a few takeaways. There's some really cool moments of bravery in that story. Nice. That's cool. I'm proud of those. It's good. But there are also many dream detours created by fear and a lack of faith that strike for no good reason. 
Just because we were dropped from a label doesn't mean that we were a bad band. In fact, many bands are dropped. Katy Perry, you can like Katy Perry or not. I'm a huge fan. But Katy Perry was dropped and ignored for years and years and years before she became famous. And the stories of that are endless. There was no reason why we had to despair so much when we were dropped, but we did, and it affected us. And it probably sent bad energy into the world. At moments of crisis, Spy Mob and I personally relied on the opinions of others to keep our dream alive. How many here, just you can raise your hand or not, I'll see them either way, but how many here feel the pressure of others, friends, parents, to do something that may or may not be you, yeah? Yeah, we can all relate to that. And when you're in the record business where image is everything, we're really susceptible to that. And that's not being brave. You know, we certainly need to consider others along our journey. But being brave is about being in touch with who am I in this situation where I have authority leaning on me. And I think we could have faced some of those times more boldly. Finally, our childhood and childlike dreams evolve and change as we get to know ourselves better. And we're going to talk about that later. So what are these childlike dreams that I'm referring to? The dreams of children are powerful because children are very in touch with that deep, mushy, raw, fiercely uncensored place where our truth lives in abundance. Why? Why are kids in touch with their truth? Because as shiny new people, kids live vulnerably. We're going to hear that word a lot. They come into the world fearless and without shame and don't even know such things exist. Kids love and trust themselves and they love and trust the world. So their curiosity is undiminished by negative forces so far. This makes kids naturally brave. So they dream honestly and fiercely as automatically as they reach out to touch a red hot stove. The thing is, is that we're there to protect our kids. And we were protected by our parents. And when we disagree with our parents, most of the time it's because they love you and they want to protect you. And the trick is, how do we grow up? How does Cecilia and Jackson and Lewis, my kids, grow up protected without me smothering their dreams? <laughs> That's my trick as a parent. And how do you guys go from 15, 16, 17, into adulthood, you get the checking account, you get the credit card, you go to college, and how do you stay in touch with that child inside? That's the trick. So what do we learn from kids? Being brave means living vulnerably, which is to say, fearlessly. But we often don't do this because for most of us, living vulnerably is difficult to do. We've been taught to fear. We've been taught to watch out for that red hot stove, which you better watch out for because it's going to burn you. But how do you, how do you grow up and still stay in touch with that creative, mushy, raw part of you? So let's look at living vulnerably. We've talked about the word brave. We've talked about the word childlike. Now we're on to vulnerably, living vulnerably, and they're all related. Living vulnerably means being honest and speaking truthfully without exaggeration. We all know the drama queen and king. Accepting hard truths about ourselves. Being open and curious without having an agenda. Good shame is the, is the shame that, ha that we feel when we punch someone in the face and then we feel bad about it. Misplaced shame is when one friend punches another friend in the face and then blames you and then you feel guilty. So living vulnerably is knowing which shame is good and which shame is bad and not being... Uh, hampered by misplaced shame. Listening patiently in order to truly understand someone. Being comfortable with people who think differently is being vulnerable. Being willing to disagree with powerful people. How do you do that without getting in a big fight or feeling scared? Having a tendency to trust. Having a tendency to get work done on time. Being responsible. Having a moderate temper. 
everyone gets upset. Accepting being wrong when you're wrong. And being generous. Merida. I like this movie. I see a lot of animated films. I'm a dad. Who's seen Brave? Yeah? It's a cool movie. Of course, I had to, if I'm going to talk about bravery, I have to remember that. I'm glad we have fans. So I love this. When, she, when Merida says, there are those who say fate is something beyond our command, that destiny is not our own, but I know better. Our fate lives within us. You only have to be brave enough to see it. She makes a big mistake, and then she makes amends for it. She takes responsibility, and she's honest with herself. And she even has to attack a monster like Cecilia. So what's living invulnerably? Being dishonest, bending facts in our favor and exaggerating. Living in denial, being closed to new ideas, living through misplaced shame, absorbing the shame of our parents and everyone else. Having a preconceived agenda in conversations, having to convince others we're right all the time avoiding disappointing powerful people in our lives, having a tendency to mistrust and being cynical, being a procrastinator, being violent, prideful, and selfish. All of those things are living in fear. We're afraid of something. We're feeling defensive. We're hiding. You know what I'm talking about? And we all have lived like that. The awe, Wizard of Oz, the wizard was a very afraid kind of guy. He hid behind a curtain. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, he said. Who's seen the old Wizard of Oz? Do, do, people, do we still? Okay, okay, you guys still see that. That's great. Remember at the end, he's found out that there really is no Oz. It's just a man behind a curtain, which is what we all are. And sometimes we keep that even from ourselves. So these are the two lists. And the way to being brave is by staying on the left side. And when we're not, when we're on the right side, we're not being brave. And no one is entirely on one side or the other. No one is perfect. And over time, we can shift and we can change. And how we change and shift is totally up to us. It's our responsibility to be vulnerable, to be without fear when fear isn't required, when our life isn't at stake, and to be brave. Does that make sense? That's, there's a lot of stuff there. You guys tracking? OK. So I want to ask you guys, what are some things that cause us to live fearfully? It can be from your own life. It can just be in general. But what can cause us to kind of, in general, be afraid to be ourselves or to do things that are scary? Uh, yes, you. Intimidation by, Intimidation by society. Yeah, lots of messages uh, to every one of us. You know, as a, as a white male, I have it pretty good, but it's amazing how many things white males can tell you about the messages we get that, to us, are even troubling, but for everyone in society, there are messages that say, you're lesser than, you're not good enough. Next, yes, back there. Failure. The fear of failure? Love that one. And that one's going to come back. The fear of failure. Yes. Judgment from others. Judgment from others. Gosh darn it. If they just wouldn't judge. That's powerful. Um, yes? Insecurity. Yeah, that's just a big catch-all right there. Yep. What is it? Rejection. Yeah, all these are related. Judgment, rejection. Consequences of failure. Consequences of failure. Yeah, so you have the fear of failure and then the practical consequences, or in fearing those consequences. What, what if I don't succeed? One more. Yeah. A, a fear that you're wasting your time. That's a huge one. Yeah. What if I fail? Then, well, then what have I accomplished here? 
What if I pursue my dream and I don't make it? So you guys are already ahead of me. So, but these, these are the common ones, and you guys hit on a bunch of them. Common fears that keep us from dreaming bravely. Fa fear of failing at what we love most. What if I fail at drumming? And I tell people, I'm a drummer. And then I fail at it. If I fail at the thing that I tell people I am, then I'm nothing. So that was me. I didn't even tell anyone I was a drummer until I started Spy Mob. Like, I wouldn't say that. I didn't feel like I deserved it, which is totally ridiculous. Because you can always change who you are. And people will love you for it. But we're afraid. We're afraid of failing at what we love most. We're afraid of succeeding at what we love most. Like, what if I succeed? If I was an agoraphobe, but I loved drumming, and I, being an agoraphobe is you're afraid to go outside, and I was a su super successful drummer, and I had to go on tour. That's a silly example. But there are practical implications of succeeding that come with baggage that it's hard to deal with. You know, what if, you know, for writers, there are a lot of writers that don't want to be famous because of the consequences of becoming famous. The fear of disappointing others. We got judgment, rejection, all of these things. Dis disappointing ourselves. Being discovered as a fraud. Who here is really passionate about something and they're afraid that someday people are going to figure out that they're really not good at it? I know it's more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, you know, because you're probably really, it's probably easy for you, and you think it shouldn't be this easy. When we begin to live fearlessly, vulnerably, our imaginations return to that mushy, raw, fiercely uncensored place where our truth lives in abundance. Okay, so now you're grown up. Now you're grown up, and you're needing to find that dream. Let's say you don't know what you want to do. What are you going to do, Dan? You know, next year you're graduating. What are you going to do? And you don't know. Well, maybe it's time to spend some time being brave, stripping away all these negative forces around you and seeing what Dan really wants to do. So let's sum it up. It's not that we can become brave when we live vulnerably. It's that when we live vulnerably, we are, by definition, brave. And the choices we make when we live vulnerably are brave. Just by living vulnerably and being honest with ourselves and others. There's no path to bravery besides living vulnerably. You can't jump out of an airplane without jumping out of an airplane. You gotta, do, you gotta go there. This means that only by living vulnerably can we truly be brave. So vulnerability and bravery are totally linked. Which is a huge discovery for me because I've been very invulnerable at times. Which is why I play such a loud instrument. So how do we live vulnerably? Now this is, and this is getting sort of Mr. Rogers and, and Dr. Phil, but just you just got to bear with me for a moment, because this is some real stuff I'm telling you. And it's really big, and it's very personal to each of you. The key to living vulnerably, bravely, is loving ourselves. The good and the bad, and having faith in something bigger than we are. That faith can be in, any, in anything. For me, I'm hugely into science, and hugely into cosmology, and the heavens, and nature. I find my faith in taking walks at night and tripping on sidewalks and looking at the sky. So why are these things important? When we love ourselves and find meaning in the universe, we accept our truth, all the good and all the bad, and accept a truth bigger than ourselves. These things give us the courage to be our true selves and dream powerful childlike dreams. We go back to that, that place when, as Cecilia would ask me all the time during the school year, you know, it's Sunday night. Everyone knows it's Sunday night. We got school in the morning, and Cecilia is totally tuned out, and she's just like, what are we going to do tomorrow? 
she's not burdened by reality. She's not burdened by the practicalities of life. She's still dreaming because she just has faith that everything's going to work out because she doesn't have to think about that herself. So your job, and it's not, I'm not giving you a simple assignment here. I'm giving you the assignment of your life, is to find ways to get back to that mushy, I love, I love that word. I don't know why I put it up there, but it's just that raw, sensitive center where you find yourself. And when you're there, you're not thinking of what your mom is thinking about you being there or what your dad thinks. It's about you being with yourself. And that, and that probably right there is the definition of love, just spending time with yourself. If we're living vulnerably, do all of our childlike dreams come true? Do all of those dreams come true? Well, no, there's lots of factors involved with a dream coming true. I probably, at this point, couldn't be the world's fastest knitter. I've never knitted in my life. I could have that dream, but maybe there's a better dream for me to pursue. And if I'm living vulnerably, that will come to me. The only way to really understand what your childlike dreams are, which again can come to you at any time in your life, sometimes in childhood, often, but the only way to have, to have those insights about yourself is to live vulnerably. Final thought. Our bravery and childlike dreams grow best. This is a big, this is a big point, especially if, for your generation. Our bravery and childlike dreams grow best in our quiet, undramatic moments when our phones are off and we're disconnected from input, when we're all alone with our brave, childlike thoughts. Who it would admit to, I mean, I'm the first one to raise my hand on this. Who would admit to feeling a little uncomfortable or hugely uncomfortable when they don't know where their phone is? Right? Yeah, I mean, and that's, and I love this thing. And in some ways, this helps me be brave. <laughs> but it also takes me away from me. Who, who would agree that not having your phone is probably a good thing every once in a while, probably on a weekly basis for many hours at a time? Yeah? OK, great. And it's because we know that it brings us back to ourselves. We have to deal with our own thoughts. And we don't have to post those thoughts anywhere. <laughs> so Cecilia Grace, my current favorite brave childlike dreamer, sums this idea up in her song, And I Know What to Say for Me. I'm going to play that song now. And this song is a couple years old. And I would the way I get these videos of Cecilia is that I She's an improviser, and she makes up songs all the time. And I don't know how she does it. My, my songwriter friends want to figure out how she does it. She writes remarkable songs, and this is one of them. And I did not remember this song at all. It was only when I was going back through these recordings that I found it. But I love it. I hope you like it. I know what to do. When you're alone with you And I also see How fun it can be To see the world into me And I know what to say for me
Uh, so go forth, be vulnerable, be brave, and dream on. Thank you so much for having me. Are there any thoughts? First of all, let me say one thing before the Q&A. If you want to send me an email, you can send me an email at that address. And I have a, I'm busy, but I would love to hear from you guys and hear what's on your mind. And feel free and please visit my blog. But is there anything that any teacher or attendee wants to say or disagree with? Totally open to be torn to shreds. Yeah. Are any of my kids into music? Yeah, they all, they all are. So Cecilia is just, I mean, it just pours out of her all the time. <laughs> and the only thing I ever say to her, and of course I'm really aware of, like, I don't want to, you know, she can't, in the car she's always singing, and my only, my message to her is just keep it down, because the three of us, the boys and I are having a conversation. Um, so I try not to silence it. The boys play piano, they're better uh, left, right, hand players than I am, but they don't love it. And we just, uh, their mom is a, dan a modern dancer. So there's tons of creativity all around us and we're not, we're not pressing them to be artistic. But in the case of Cecilia, like she's just super creative. Anything else, any thoughts or? Yeah, you can ask about anything. It doesn't have to be bravery. Have you ever thought about putting your daughter in a commercial if you're working with commercial people? Yeah, that, have I ever thought of putting Cecilia in TV commercials? You know, just this last week, we had a meeting at a really cool, uh, reputable talent agency in Minneapolis um, because she really wants to act. She really wants to, to do that. And... I figure, you know, as long as it's on her terms and, you know, I, and I like the people she's working with, that's great. Because that can be a crazy world. But yeah, I'm trying, trying to get her out there because she really wants to do it. Yes? I live in St. Paul, but my company's in Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah? So how many albums did the most successful record I was? Uh, that would be probably the first NERD record, which, um, I, you know, I don't even know how many it sold, but it went, I think it went platinum, which is probably, which is like a million copies. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do want to make one comment about NERD, um, but you first. So what do I do in my job at a day, on a day-to-day -day basis? So I do a bunch of things for my, my company. And my partner is the creative director, John Hermanson, just a brilliant guy, a great songwriter. But what I do is I work with um, advertising agencies. I'm, I'm, I have a producer under me who handles the day-to-day uh, -day nuts and bolts production. But I'm more in charge of the relationships and going out and talking to agencies about how they can better use music in advertising. Because as we know, sometimes we're really inspired by the music we hear in ads, and other times it's really bad. So our goal is to make ads as much of an opportunity for artists as possible, and to, to make them as creative as possible. I, w I do want to cut, yes, you go. Oh, um, when you like, got called to go to California, did you ever go back to college, or did you like, finish it um, so I graduated from St. Olaf College, um, and then it was after that that I was on my way to grad school to get my PhD, and that's when I turned the car around and did. So I did get my BA, and I do want to say that I learned to write words in college. So college isn't for everyone, or it's not for everyone right away. I personally, you know, there, were, there, were, there was bravery, there was lack of bravery, I fell down, I hurt, but I wouldn't change a thing in that journey because at, in college, I learned to write. 
and I learned to connect ideas. And that's, that was, college was a really important thing for me, and I'm glad I did it. But it was a detour from, from my favorite things. But maybe it was a detour I had to make. I want to say one thing about Pharrell. Pharrell's big, he's awesome, he's famous, he has a great record, and Happy is a fantastic song, but, and people appreciate Pharrell for being super creative and for being a real genius behind other artists who are trying to figure out what next. But I spent a lot of time with Pharrell. We were in the studio um, rehearsing with NERD when uh, this really old artist um, named Justin Timberlake, uh, <laughs> who, um, who, any Justin fans here? Oh. Okay, great, okay, great. So he's not too old for you now, right? Okay. But when Justin was making, when Justin was making Justified, you know that great record? Produced by Pharrell, we were in the studio with Pharrell at night rehearsing NERD songs for our live performances. During the day, he and Justin were making that album, and at night, NERD was practicing, and we were all hanging out. Gave Justin a drum lesson once. <laughs> and he's an amazing musician, but my, <laughs> there's one of my tangents. But Pharrell is the most childlike creative mind that I've ever met. And, and that, that, was a huge lesson for me and my band. My band was very meticulous. Spy Mob was very meticulous. We were slow. We were perfectionists. And in some ways, that's just who we were. And it made, it's part of what made us great. It also held us back. Pharrell would write a song in an afternoon. Bang it, record it, it's done. You know, and there's hot in here. It's getting hot in here. Or, you know, just, you know songs on Justified, Rock Your Body. You know, those songs came fast, and he trusted it. So I'm not surprised by Pharrell's success these days because I see where it came from. And I encourage you to study more of his work and not just his hits because he's a really interesting mind. Yes? Do I still talk with Pharrell? You know, no, I haven't talked with him. I think the last time I saw him was a couple years ago when NERD came through. And when we do, you know, it's hugs and high fives. And, um, but I'm in touch with a lot of the, his people around him. And it could be that tomorrow I'll get a call and, you know, we'll do something. But he's so busy and he, the demands on his life are so busy that I, I probably won't hear from him very often. Oh, yeah. You know, um, th good question. What are some commercials that our music has been in? Uh, if you go to egg-music.com, you'll see a bunch. Lots of Target stuff. Lots of Target stuff. Um, you do? You work at Target? <laughs> it's like a circle of creativity right here. We're writing the tunes. You're rocking the sails. That's awesome. Um, and then you, there was another, was there something, question here? Oh yeah, back, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, I got your back. I got your back on that, yeah. You know, you know, look, in, in preparing for this speech, it's daunting, because I was like, you know, of course, I go online and I think, Who, who's written about brave? I think everyone has written bravery. Everyone's written about bravery. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go from my hip. I'm going to put my daughter in there. But bravery gets thrown around like confidence. and I mean, it's, it's huge which is why I used so many words today. I hope it made sense. But a any other questions? Yes? How often do you get to play either for fun or for <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I, I had this, that realization that like, drumming isn't my, my core passion, but it is something I love to do. And I'm convinced, because I did it from such a young age, my brain is wired for drumming. 
In other words, I think I created a brain that was wired for drumming because I drummed every day for so many years. So I do like to get back to it. it physically, it feels good. And I do have a cover band with Dee Schneider and Ed Robertson of the, of the Bare Naked Ladies and Adam Gardner from Guster and Stefan Lassard, bass player for uh, Dave Matthews' band. It's his band, actually. And we're called Yukon Cornelius, like the prospector from uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's Cornelius with a K, Yukon Cornelius. You can look, go onto our website, and we play covers. We play heavy metal. We play not heavy metal. Dee Schneider of Twisted Sister sings lead on our heavy metal songs. We play a couple times a year. I love doing that. That's super demanding because when we play these shows, we, we usually play at like winter sports events, like X Games for the athlete parties, and we do benefits and things. And we'll play for two hours. So I have to go from not playing much to then working up like 24 songs, and I just practice every night because I'm kind of a physical player. I like to move my hair around. I can't do it. I can't do it unless I'm drumming. Like this other animal comes out of me when I'm drumming. Any final question? Yes? Afterwards, you absolutely can. There was a request for a selfie with me, which by definition is not a selfie. But I suppose, I guess it is if you're in it, right? Any other final question? Okay, I think that's it. You feel free to send me an email.